Hello and welcome once again to our Africa Cup of Nations special here on France 24. I'm Jean-Emile Jamin. Joining me once again on the show is the magnificent Tando Asibia, a sports journalist. Uh, we're already into the knockout uh, stages of uh, this edition of the Africa Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast. What a tournament it's been so far. Thrills and spills and shocks. And the last 16 already starting off so brilliantly. Early on Saturday, we saw Angola thrashing southern neighbours Namibia 3-0 in a match which uh, saw each team receive a red card. And in the late game, a clash against the Titans saw Nigeria knock out Cameroon 2-0. It was the same uh, stadium. Cameroon, of course, beat Nigeria all the way back in 1984 to lift their first ever AFCON title. This time, though, the football gods smiling down on the Super Eagles. And uh, after having a goal ruled out for offsides, Victor Asimhen squared Vardemola Lukman in the second half. It was Lukman again latching onto a brilliant cross, sending Nigeria through to yet another quarterfinal. And I now have uh, the pleasure First off, of uh, being joined by a man who was at the Stade Felix Houphouet Bonny, uh, our very own uh, James Vecina. He joins us now. Uh, James, it, what an intense battle, but ultimately Nigeria coming through. Tell me just one question who were the home fans rooting for in the Ivory Coast? Uh, home for a lot of fans behind Nigeria. I'd say the most of the stadium are definitely behind them. And uh, fans are basically leaving just behind us right now, and they were leaving much faster for the Cameroon side because it's been a terrible night, completely different to what you mentioned uh, just earlier on, that, which is history now. And Cameroon fans are fed up. They're tired. Very, very little change in what they saw tonight compared to the, what went on in the group stage for the Indomitable Lions, who were far from indomitable tonight. Nigeria, far superior, a different league, a different gear. That's one of the big differences that I noticed definitely on the pitch. Uh, Nigeria has, sh has shifted up uh, much, much, much faster than Cameroon, who are unable to keep any pace and unable to ever keep the ball. This is one of the crucial sides. Once they had the ball, could never do anything in their opponent's half. And that caused a lot of issues because on goal, well, failed to find any target there. Whereas Nigeria did what Ni Nigeria has been doing up until now, which is not so much the most exciting uh, movements that we've seen on there. But getting the job done, almost got the job done very easily, as you mentioned there, with uh, VAR ruling out a first goal. I looked at that, when that goal happened, I looked at the time and I thought, oh, we might have a long 80 minutes going here, considering their track record in the, in, in the tournament so far with just a single goal every time. They managed to find that second one uh, from Lukman after that and sealed the game. And Nigeria are looking good. Nigeria are looking very rested. They're looking composed and they've got an attack that they need. Credit to Victor Ossiman, didn't see him uh, find the target tonight, but he is everywhere. He's running down everywhere and he is a man doing his job. And you, you can see exactly why he's uh, getting to the level that he is at today, whether back home or at the Africa Cup of Nations. Uh, for Nigeria, of course, a big night and they're set to go far if they continue playing this way. But for, for Cameroon, it's too difficult to say what their future is going to be for now. Rigobert Song, we can imagine that his time with them could be cut very, very short because there's very little. It's hard to see what positive they can really take from this year's, uh, this year's tournaments because after that thrashing of it, well, almost thrashing of a game uh, in the group stages, they finally made it through. But today, tonight, fans speaking to them on, on the, leaving, leaving the stadium just wanted to see change. They didn't see any change from the group stages. No, no adapting uh, from what they saw tonight. Abubakar, Vincent Abubakar came on uh, late on in the game, but it was too late. Nigeria got that second goal and that was game over for them. Uh, the game over for, for Cameroon, of course. Uh, we're going to go to Tando now, James. Um, uh, we, we heard James say uh, nearly a thrashing because that's what it really felt like. I mean, we didn't really see anything from Cameroon. No fight back that we saw in that uh, last match in the groups to get through. I think that was one of the main points that I noted, especially coming into the second half. Cameroon yeah, seemed to is, lack creativity long. in their play. And I think that was one thing where they were found wanting. You could even see on the bench, they seemed disorganized. In previous games, they had Samuel Eto'o. And I know that him and his him and um, coach Rigobert Song, they have a good relationship. And I think they want to kind of create their own dream team. That will then be some beautiful story where we can say that, oh, they went from the champions of uh, Cameroon winning the AFCON together. And now they've coached and managed and even run the federation to victory of the Cup of Nations. But... I don't know, you need a lot more than that. And I think you could see it. It was evident on the field, it was evident on the bench, it was evident all around that they were unprepared and they didn't necessarily, they didn't look like a team that was together. 
it's it's almost two two different sides because you've got the goalkeeping situation with Cameroon, Andre Onana on the bench replaced by his cousin. Uh, but then you've also got the attack of Nigeria, which was so fluid and also uh, Osimhen, as James mentioned, working for the team this time. He worked so brilliantly for the team. Like he said, he was everywhere. There was no way that Osimhen was not creating chances for his team. And I think even the collaboration that he had with the rest of his teammates, looking at the creation of that second game, building up from behind, you'd see Iwobi would be then creating the attack and building it up, ushering it through to either Osimhen to pick up from the midfield and then carry it through to Lukman. Both of the goals were created that way. And I think that is sensational attacking from Nigeria. And so the Super Eagles, Coach Pedro, they've, they're, they're really working on something. And I think Nigeria on the upward trajectory in this competition. Jose Pizarro doing uh, wonders. Of course, that was uh, the first, uh, well, the late latest match on uh, Saturday. Uh, that was after a, a battle of Southern Hemisphere teams uh, where the Sables of Angola uh, dominated Namibia's Brave Warriors 3-0, advancing to the quarterfinals for the third time in their history. The match at the Stade Buaca was though also full of controversy. Angola's goalkeeper Neblu was shown red for handling a shot outside the area, only for Jelson Dalla for his team scoring the opening goal. Then Namibia's Lubeni Haukongo received his marching orders for fouling as the last defender. Jelson added a second with a powerful header before Mabululu uh, curled around Lloyd Kazapua uh, to win the game. A, a fantastic flowing match uh, for Angola. And uh, you really have to say that they are looking every bit worth uh, their uh, progress to the quarterfinals. Definitely. Remember at the beginning of the tournament, we had the conversation of, okay, when we're stepping the conversation away from who can be the possible victors of the tournament, what else are we excited for in the tournament? And this was exactly what I was talking about. I spoke about the Southern Hemisphere, the Kasafa teams bringing up a surprise, and that's exactly what Angola are doing. They look organized. They look prepared. The attack is insane. And I think even defensively, they've organized themselves quite well. And it's just unfortunate they've had, I don't want to say easier opponents compared to perhaps like a Nigeria and the opponents that they've had in their build up. But I just feel like it's not going to be easy for them in going into the quarterfinals and the rest of the tournament. But I do think that they're very, very, very capable. Of course, we have to remember they topped a group uh, which included the likes of uh, Algeria. So, uh, I mean, actually knocking them completely out as bottom of the group. So this is an Angola team. Uh, James, I want to come back to you. Uh, this is an Angola team which really we do feel could be uh, dark horses, would you say? Uh, it's it's early to say, but you can't rule anything out, can you? I mean, what's funny in this fixture is that you've got normally in the round 16, as things work, as you normally get, obviously, a higher ranked team coming up, a lower ranked team, and this was far from the case uh, today. And what you got from there was two teams really fighting for it. Obviously, uh, for Angola, uh, doing a much, much better job. And as mentioned, they're really looking pretty strong on that attack, giving everything despite, and this was the surprising thing, is that things for this time were not going their way. If you're taking what happens in the 17th minute with that red card, a choice taking out a midfielder uh, that in the end paid off because that attack still was able to continue and pretty much shows that Angola is able to, uh, to, to, to manage these situations, even though obviously they're not one of the most experienced teams, but definitely more experienced than their opponents who for the first time uh, actually made it round. They got that first win in the AFCON for them, uh, but uh, that is a short uh, time and it will still be success in some way. But for Angola, let's hope to see some good, good, good things on the field because this is clearly, from what we've seen today, they're giving it everything and we could see them perhaps, yes, become some of the dark horses. It's early to say, but I think we've got a, some big clashes, yes, coming up uh, ahead for them. Uh, you're nodding your head there, absolutely, Tando. And now we can wait for an Angola-Nigeria clash. It is going to be insane. These are two <laughs> very strong attacking teams. And I think seeing where they maybe cancel each other out or who's then going to be pushing through to then, I don't know, just do something different. Um, they do say that defense is what wins championships. And that's what we're going to start seeing from the quarterfinals going forward. Nigeria's defense wasn't the very strongest today. And I think that was a point that we mentioned was that defensively, they don't seem to be as brilliantly organized as perhaps a, Senegal, a Senegalese team. And I do think that if they don't work on that, that could be a very dangerous point when you're facing opponents like Angola, who are very fast paced, who are very creative, in front of goal, who use, who capitalize on the rules of the game, or not even just the rules of the game, who capitalize on all aspects of the game. I saw them in this last game against Namibia. They capitalize on set pieces. They capitalize on everything that they can work around. And so if 
you're going to be coming on as Nigeria against an op opponent as creative as Angola. You're going to have to do a whole lot of work. Also, we need to see what's going to be happening with their goalkeeper. That is a little bit concerning because he was doing quite well for them in the tournament. And they've been keeping clean sheets, I think only conceding one or two goals. And so that's not the kind of loss you want to be facing when you're coming up against a team as strong as the Angolans. Certainly uh, an injury worry there for uh, Nigeria in the goalkeeping department. We will uh, keep up to date with that. But first, a time to catch all our breaths. Look forward to a Sunday, which uh, serves up yet another spectacle when the two Guineas lock horns, Equatorial Guinea, uh, flying high from that 4-0 thrashing of hosts Ivory Coast, uh, looking to get the better of Guinea-Conakry, who are yet to really kick into gear. Uh, then it's Egypt's chance to show that they were their pedigree as they take on the leopards of the DRC who have not won a match but have not lost either this campaign and it's the same for Egypt we'll get on to that but first uh, Equatorial Guinea uh, Tando what a breath of fresh air we saw that 4-0 result against uh, against uh, the host Ivory Coast and I, I mean I just want to talk about them because they are just so formidable and uh, you can't rule out anything in terms of uh, reaching even p beyond the semi-final I think a team like this is all the more exciting to watch play in this tournament because you don't know what to expect from them. And I think that's been the challenge with all of the other bigger teams in the tournament, with the exception of Morocco, or maybe even including Morocco, seeing how they performed against the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, is that when you're coming up as one of the teams who weren't necessarily the favourites in the tournament, you have all the field and all the space to be creative and I think when teams undermine you coming into a tournament, then you have the likes of Nsue who can then come in and perform. Let's, because... let's, let's actually hear from him because, I mean, you touch exactly on the player I want to talk about. <laughs> Emilio Nsue, uh, 34 years old, and he's just outshining everyone. Uh, let, let's take a listen to uh, what he has to say about his form and his age. To be honest, uh, everyone talked to me about the age, 34, but uh, for me, my hero is Cristiano Ronaldo, that is older than me. Me, I care a lot of my body. I care too much about everything. Uh, I like to, to eat healthy. So for me, I don't think it's going to be the last one because I feel better than when I was 20 years old. And I am slow, but I have more experience, and I think the experience is a stronger point. I just imagine, like, if you're one of these clubs who is scouting people, and you're like, wow, what a young talent, and then you just find and swear, you're like, where has this guy been? Exactly. Um, on my way here in the taxi, we were actually listening to the radio, and they spoke about those AFCON players. And I think they don't necessarily shine. They play in third division, second tier, wherever they play at club, le club level. And then when they come to the AFCON, they just shine brighter than anything that we've ever seen. And that's another component that we do see is the hunger. Is it maybe a hunger to leave a legacy or to bring his country? It's national pride. It's so much bigger than just it being for money. And I think that's what's shining through with this Equatorial Guinea inside. And of course, uh, we're going to have to see if uh, the big stars of Guinea can also come to the fore in this match, uh, the likes of Nabi Keita, uh, Serhu Girasi, the Bayer Leverkusen uh, man. But uh, yeah, a lot, a lot really to look forward to, of course. And then there you've got the pharaohs of Egypt up against the DRC. Uh, there are some questioning whether the uh, Egyptians can uh, come to terms with the loss of Mohamed Salah, but we have seen others uh, step up to the plate. Mustafa Mohamed, he's been a good one in this tournament and I think um, he's risen to the platform and we're enjoying how that's looking. I just hope that they can put in together a comprehensive effort and then perform as a collective. Am I saying that they're capable of defeating the Democratic Republic of Congo? I'm not sure because what we saw against Morocco was something of a shocker. I think the way the Congolese were playing in that particular game was kind of like an, an like just a cage into what they're actually capable of. And you can then see that these people are nothing to play about. And so as the Egyptians doing their research and doing their preparation into this game, they're definitely going to have to look at how they organize themselves in defense, even in the mid middle of the park. There's no way that you should be leaving any gaps for the Congolese to then seep through because <laughs> when they do, it's not cute. In fact, Rui Vitoria, the Egyptian coach, said exactly that. Uh, let's hear from him uh, when analyzing the opponents for tomorrow's match. It's a fact that we considered all of these goals. We have also scored a lot. We are a tremendously positive team on the pitch. And when I say positive, we have a good attacking dynamic. 
But we really have to understand that we have to improve defensively and be more rigorous, more focused. We have to realize that our opponents often don't need to have a very good 90 minutes. All they need is five minutes of concentration from us. Just five minutes, and that is the beauty of this tournament, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think five minutes, two minutes, however many minutes. And also the game management is going to be very important in all of these games. I think also you're going to need some very dynamic athletes on this pitch because the conditions are not very easy. We saw in the past two games that they'd have to take um, cooling breaks or some water breaks. And so you're really going to have to manage a whole lot, whether it's going to the strength and conditioning, whether it's going into the way that they are preparing themselves and the kinds of conditions that they are training under, and even on the day of, how you then manage the energy, whether it's going to be in how the substitutions you're making, because you can see that a player, certain player is fatigued. And even then, when you bring on a certain player, what is it that they bring on to change the game plan or then to change the structure of the game? And also seeing that little gap there between 80 and 90 minutes is not to be played with. And so I think those are the tiny little intricacies that everyone's going to have to work for. The if business, they're going for The, the real business end of the match. It is so <laughs> important. Unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to wrap it up. Thanks once again to Tando C. Uh, thanks again uh, to James Vecino who came to us from the uh, Côte d'Ivoire and uh, thank you to you for watching uh, this edition of uh, the Africa Cup of Nations special here on France 24. We'll see you next time.